to be in God's house this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 1 this morning. And we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 25 of Matthew chapter 1 this morning. I don't know if anybody looked at the bulletins or not, but uh, the title of the message today is The Greatest Christmas Message Ever. And I want you to know that uh, when a preacher puts that in the bulletin, then he sets the bar pretty high. But the truth be known, today, it's not about the messenger, it's about the message. And I begin to think about this, I begin to think about what would make the greatest Christmas message ever. And I begin to think about what it would take. You know, first of all, some of you would say for the greatest Christmas message ever, it'd have to be short. Uh, some of you, and I didn't hear any amens on that, I thought maybe I'd hear a few amens on that. It has to be short. The message has to be short. Uh, maybe, and you know that's a challenge for this preacher, right? Okay. Um, and also, it'd have to be sweet. It had to be such a sweet spirit to it and a sweet message to it that it just resonated with us and it just made us feel good inside. Uh, it had to be simple. Uh, the greatest Christmas message ever would have to be simple. Uh, the simple simplicity uh, of a message that we could understand. And then finally, it'd have to be special. I believe that the greatest Christmas message ever would have to be special. So I'm going to try to give you the shortest, sweetest, simplest, specialist Christmas message you've ever heard. Now, I don't know that that's possible, but we're going to give it a try. Um, Here it goes. Here's the greatest Christmas message ever. And I want to begin in God's Word because, like I said, it's not about the messenger. It's about the message. And the message is in God's Word. And the message is found in the Gospels. And it talks about Christmas. The world doesn't understand what Christmas is all about. But we do. That's why we're here today, right? That's why you chose to be here is because you understand what Christmas is all about. So we're going to stand. We're going to read Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was uh, betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph found, or Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But when, while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, you Mary, to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus." For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Fathers, we come before you this morning. We thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord God, for what this day represents. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, we just give you the praise and the honor and the glory that you deserve today. We thank you that you left your glory, came to this world as a babe in a manger. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you gave us life. That life came at a high price of you giving your life on, our, on the cross for our sins. If someone here today, within the sound of my voice, does not know you as Lord and Savior, what a special time for someone to give their life to Jesus for you today. Lord, we just pray as believers, as we gather together, Lord, we know the greatest message ever that comes at Christmas, and that is your Son. Jesus, we thank you and we praise you today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So today, so today, here it goes. Here's the greatest Christmas message ever. It's this. First thing that we have to know is God came. Plain and simple, God came. Period. End of story. God came. That's it. That's the Christmas message. God came. So how about we all just pray and go home? You think we ought to close right now with that message? 
Irvin, I can't believe it. Where's, is Irvin in here? I can't believe I didn't get an amen out of you on that one. You know, short and sweet. The simple message of Christmas. The special time that we celebrate. Some of you say amen. Let's just say the name Jesus and go home. I said short, but I didn't say non-existent. I, I said a short message, but not a sliver. I began to think about uh, what, what people make, want to make of Christmas. It's like a Christmas pie. The other day I was at the church and uh, Merle come walking in and Merle had something wrapped in aluminum foil and it was in a round sphere shape and I began to look at it and I realized that is a pie. And he handed me that pie and he said that Becky wanted to give this to me. And I thank you for that pie, Becky. A pecan pie. And I was thinking about that pecan pie and how Merle could have been greedy. Merle could have thought, you know, on the way to town, I'll just take and I'll just cut out a little piece of that pie and give it to the preacher and I'll keep the rest for myself. Merle could have said, you know what? A sliver of pie is enough. When I got that pie, I didn't want a piece of pie. I wanted the whole pie. And I was glad that I got that. But sometimes I believe that that's exactly what we want to do with Christmas. We talk about Jesus. We know that that's the message of Christmas. But we take that piece of the pie that we call Christmas and we call it about Jesus. And we cut it down to the point that it's a sliver and not the whole. In other words, we want to make Jesus part of Christmas, but not the whole of Christmas. You know, we know that message. But I fear that it gets lost in the middle of everything else going on. All the Christmas gatherings, all the gifts, all the goodies. And you think about your life and you think about Christmas this year. How much of the piece of the pie did you give to God and his message this year? How much of it was about all the other things that go on? And those things are good in and of themselves. There's nothing wrong with that. But how much of Christmas and that message did you give to God? Because the true Christmas message is about God. It's the whole pie. It's, it's what it's all about. And so I fear that even as believers, sometimes we can get so caught up in the activities and the gatherings and the gifts that we forget that God is the reason. He is the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas is plain and simple. God came. God came to this earth. It says the birth of Jesus in verse 18. That's what Christmas is about. We know that. But what example do we set in our lives? You know, the world doesn't know that Jesus is the reason for the season. And we can say that and we can say Merry Christmas and God bless everyone and, and all that. But the truth be known, the world misses that. You know, the world is not in church hearing that message today. They don't hear the message of Christmas. The, the world, they don't hear the message and they don't see the message. Why? Because the message is to be lived out in our life. The message of Christmas. So I ask you today, what is your message that you're giving the world? When you look at the world and you go out, what do they see in us? If I was looking in a mirror and I was looking at myself and what I portrayed this Christmas, what did I portray to a lost world that needs that message that God came? Did I live that out in my life? Is my example in such a way that it's not just about being uh, self-absorbed or maybe doing a few, few good things for a few good people? Or is it about that it's Jesus and He's the whole reason for Christmas? It's about God came. The birth of Jesus Christ. It talks about it in the Bible and that's what it's all about. It's also about God's call. You know, not, God just didn't come at Christmas time. God called at Christmas time. It's the story of Mary and Joseph. You know, what we do with Mary and Joseph, and it's a sweet story about Mary and Joseph. So, so we have our, our, our shortness of, of God came, but we also have the sweetness of Mary and Joseph. You know, a lot of times we portray nativities. And I think about the way we portray all these nativities. And, and, and a nativity it, it, I mean, is the birth. It's the birth of Christ. That's what it's about. And, and, and we enacted that out in the parking lot this year. And people drove by and saw that. And, and my wife has a whole house full of nativities. In fact, I think I asked her yesterday, she has 37 nativities set up in the house. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't go anywhere in the house without seeing the nativity. And there's always that picture of Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. And the nativities are like, it's almost like this. We, we think about a nativity, and it's almost, like, uh, it's almost like we portray it as a Hallmark movie. How many of you like Hallmark movies? Oh my gosh, many of you. 
How, how many of you dislike Hallmark movies? There's a few of you. Okay. The guys raise their hands real big. And Stephanie. Well, Stephanie, that's, I, that's unbelievable. Okay. You know, you know what? Yeah, yeah. You know what? You know what really makes a Hallmark movie? It's the same thing. You know, you can have 37 nativities, you can have 37 Hallmark movies, and it basically is the same thing. The ingredients are this. You, you can take a dash of romance, an ounce of obstacles that get in the way, and have a happy ending, and you've got yourself a Hallmark movie. That's all it takes, right? A dash of romance, an ounce of obstacle to get through, and a happy ending, and you've got yourself a Hallmark movie. I could write scripts for that all day long. You watch them on TV. I tell you what, Hallmark movies to me, now nah, I'll go on, I'll go past that, okay. I don't want to do that. It's Christmas, i got to be nice. You know, they say the same thing over and over and over. They try to say it a different way in a different style. Just like with the nativities, we have ceramic nativities, we have wooden nativities, we have porcelain nativities, we have all these different types of nativities. But it, it, it basically it means this. It means that God called Mary and Joseph to a task. Now, their love story wasn't as pretty as a Hallmark movie. Because when they were called by God, Mary was found to be with child. She wasn't married yet. Because she was conceived by the Holy Spirit to carry the Christ child. God had called her to carry the Christ child. And you think that's a small task. That's a big task that Mary was given. But also, what about Joseph? It talks about Joseph here in Matthew. It doesn't talk about him much in Luke where I was preaching. But Joseph, it says that Joseph in verse 19 was a just man. In other words, what if Joseph was an angry man or a jealous man or a misunderstanding man? He was a just man and he chose to believe God sent to him by an angel to do a task that God had called him to do. Now we look back at that and we think it's all a beautiful little story and all that, you know, about the nativity. I tell you what, it was real life. Mary and Joseph had to face very big obstacles, very big fears, very big doubts, many things to get to the point that they were at the scene of the nativity when Christ was born. You see, when God called them, here's what they did. They chose to believe, and they chose to follow. They chose to believe God when He called them, and they chose to follow. Now today, it's the same story. You can take that and you can superimpose that onto your life. You know, God calls us to many things. God calls us to salvation. God calls us to serve Him. God calls us to be in church, to be a disciple, to be, to be more like Christ. But God's calling, when He puts that on our life, is to do this. Number one, we have to believe God. Do you believe God today? Do you believe God has his hand on your life? Do you believe God is leading your life? Do you believe God is going to take care of you in your life? Do you believe God knows what's best for your life? Do you believe that no matter what you're doing in life, when God calls you to do that, you have to believe God? Yes, you do. Same thing Mary and Joseph had to do. They had to believe God, but it's one thing to believe, and it's another thing to act upon that and follow. Now, I don't know about you guys, but but uh, how, how would you like... To have to, even after Mary and Joseph accepted that calling and that following, how would you like to have to go to your nine-month pregnant wife and say, uh, uh, Honey, uh, we're going to have to pack up the luggage and we're going to have to head to, to Bethlehem. We're going to have to leave our home. We're going to have to leave our pediatrician. We're going to have to leave all the comforts. And we're not going to hop on in the car and drive to Bethlehem, you're going to have to come out, and I have to be careful of this because I was proven that this is not actually a biblical fact. This is a thought that Mary didn't even say in the Bible that she rode a donkey. But she may have walked. Mary herself had to nine months pregnant. Think about this, ladies. Nine months pregnant. Your husband says, we're going to go on a journey, and we're going to get there. And you get to that journey, and you find out that your husband hasn't even made reservations at the hotel. And they knock on the door, and guess what? There's no room at the hotel. I had that experience on my honeymoon, and it was not a good experience. I told my wife, there's a thousand hotels in, the, in Lake of the Ozarks. We'll just get one when we get there. And guess what? We almost spent our honeymoon in the back of the car. Wasn't a good experience. Thank God there was one room left. There was one room left, but guess what? There was no room for them. So Joseph comes back up and he says, well, honey, I got some more bad news. Guess what? There's not even a bed for you to sleep in. There's not a place for you to stay. But guess what? The owner says, we can go out back and in this stable and in this probably cave-like 
crater, and that's where we can stay. And guess what? You're going to have your baby right there. Does that sound like a Hallmark movie to you? Does that sound like a calling that you want on your life? Guess what? When God calls us to something, sometimes it can get messy. Sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes it takes faith to believe God called me to this and he will get me through this. And if I follow him, he will always provide. Amen. God called Mary and Joseph, two people. We like to make a glamour story of it, a Hallmark movie out of it. But guess what? It was real people, real facts, real dangers, real things they had to face. And they were just like you and I. They had to believe in God and follow him. Next thing is in the greatest Christmas message ever, not just that God came and not just that God called two ordinary people to serve him, but also that God saves That's the best part of all, God saves. When I was looking at verse 21, I was looking at Mary and Joseph and the calling on their life and what God had called them to do. And then all of a sudden, I read verse 21 in a different way. It says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Have you ever read a sentence and you realize how much that sentence encompasses? Do you realize... The impact of verse 21. Verse 21 says, She will bring forth a son, you will call him Jesus. And then it goes on to say, And he will save his people from their sin. Now Jesus didn't save his people from their sin that night in Bethlehem in the manger when he was born. That encompasses a 33 year life that Jesus lived. That encompasses the day that Jesus took on that public ministry when he was baptized by John the Baptist. That includes the time that Jesus taught his disciples, called his disciples to follow him, called his disciples to be willing to give their life for him, and finally telling his disciples, I'm going to die for them. You see, verse 21 not only is the picture of Christmas, it's a picture of of Good Friday. It's the picture of Resurrection Sunday. It's the picture not only of the cradle, it's a picture of the cross, it's a picture of the tomb, it's a picture of the empty tomb, and it's a picture of Jesus being alive today. You cannot celebrate Christmas and believe in God without celebrating verse 21, that Jesus came, not just to be born, that God came, but also that God came to die. It encapsulates two of the greatest events in history in that one verse. Exactly what happened. The birth of Christ that led to the death of Christ. The manger that led to the cross. The stable that led to the grave. The Son of God becoming the salvation of man. The blood of Jesus paying the cost of the sins of the world. And the genealogy of Christ leading in to the gospel of Christ. Verse 21 sums up the gospel completely. You know what that is? You know what the gospel is? The gospel of Jesus, when you read this, it is so simple. It's a simple message. And for the life of me, whenever I look at God's plan of salvation, even at Christmas time, we talk about the birth of Christ, but what about the death of Christ, the life of Christ, the life that He gives, the forgiveness of sin? Are you glad that Jesus died and forgave you of your sins? That message is so simple, yet so hard. There's millions of people that know that Jesus died on the cross. There's millions of people that come into churches and they know the message, the simple plan of salvation that God gives. It's so simple that a, that a, a four-year-old can understand, a five-year-old can understand, a six-year-old can understand, or a hundred-year-old can understand. But so many people don't accept and they walk away. You see, God's plan of salvation is very simple. We're all sinners. We confess our sins to Jesus. We ask Jesus to come into our life because God is the only one that can save us from our sins. Why? Because He came into this world. He calls us to salvation. You can't find God on your own. God calls you to, from the moment that God called you to new life, God was calling you to give your life to Jesus. You see, God saves. That's the gospel. The gospel's 
is part the the Christmas story is part of the gospel that we read. So God came, God calls, God saves. We admit that we have sin in our life. We believe in Jesus. We confess our sins to Him. We ask Him to come into our life, to make Him our Lord and Savior. Praise God. God came, God calls, God saves. But finally, God is with us. God is with us. What do I mean by that? Look look here at verse 22. It says, so all of this was done. What is all of this? Everything that was ever created, planned, and orchestrated by God. All of this was done that it may be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Guess what Emmanuel means? It means God with us. And today as we come in to celebrate Christmas, the greatest message that we can ever give to this world is this, that even today God is with us. And if God is with us and God is for us and God wants us, then who can be against us? All of this was done. All of prophecy was fulfilled. Why did God fulfill fulfill prophecy? Because God is perfect and God will always do what He says He will do. So today somebody may be here and you may be doubting or you may be struggling or you may be trying to trust in God for something. Maybe for salvation, maybe with something in your life. Maybe it's an obstacle that you have faced like Mary and Joseph. Maybe it was God's plan questioning what it is. Maybe it's something that you're facing in your family, in your home, in your work, and whatever it may be. But the truth be known, God is saying, I am with you and I am for you and you must trust me. Why? Because if I say that I'll do something, I will do it. God says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. God says that every word of his prophecy will be fulfilled. That night in Bethlehem when Jesus was born, a 700-year-old prophecy was being fulfilled at that very moment. God with us. God came. He was calling. He was calling to people to salvation. And today, still today, he is here. Did we come in today with expectations that God would be here with us today? Did we come here today because we know that the greatest Christmas message ever is the simplest, shortest, sweetest, most special thing that God could ever do, anyone could ever do, and that is that He would send His Son to die so that I may have life and a relationship with Him. You see, Emmanuel... God with us. You know what the greatest Christmas message is ever? And if I'm going to hold on to my promise, I've got to cut it down because I've got to keep it short. I want to keep it sweet, that there's a sweet spirit that's moving here today. I want to keep it simple, that even anyone here today in the sound of my voice knows that God is alive. That Christmas is the reason that we celebrate Jesus coming into this world. God came. But the truth be known, Jesus is with us today. It's so short. What is the message that you're sending to people around you? What is the message that we're getting out there? Is it, I am here in spite of Christmas? Or I'm here because of Christmas? I am here because I believe in this message. And I believe in God. It's such a sweet call that God has placed on my life that even though I am going through things in my life, good, bad, whatever it is, I believe God and I will follow Him. It's such a simple thing to say that God saves, but it's such a hard thing to accept that Jesus died for me. It's such a special thing to know that God wants a personal relationship with us. Today... I preached the message. But the greatest message ever is Jesus. Do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? I can't take it beyond the fact that you may not know Christ as your Savior. Here in a moment, you'll have that opportunity. That opportunity is this. It's so simple. God died for me. Jesus died for me. 
but I have to give my life to Him. I have to confess that I have sin in my life. I have to believe that God can save me. And I have to believe that Jesus rose from the dead when He died on the cross. And that He lives today and wants to give me life. For those of you who are believers, what is the Christmas message that you have given this year? You may have given many presents and gifts and seen many good things, and you may be about to go and have your Christmas Day activities and all those things, but the greatest gift that you can give, the greatest message you can ever preach, is that God gets all of the pie, and Christmas is all about Jesus. He is the reason, and He's the greatest message ever. Let's pray. Father, we come to You this morning. I thank you, God, for the sweet spirits that's here with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I pray that we would understand that Christ is the reason. It's the reason we do everything that we do. Father, I pray that this message, though we've heard it a thousand times before, it may be, seem as old as a Hallmark movie to us over and over, but the truth is there's no life in that, but there's life in the message of Christ. Jesus, we thank you for the life that you give. We thank you that there were faithful men and women that, such as Mary and Joseph that carried out the gospel. They were part of the gospel, carrying the Christ child through all the obstacles to, to, to a lost and dying world. Lord, I thank you that the plan of salvation is so simple that even I can understand and accept. And Lord, what a special time it is to know that you're here with us even today. Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.